Welcome to Old Guy Tech. The OGT.TV recording studio. Technology for the rest of us. Hi, I'm Rob Charney with Old Guy Tech TV. I'm here today with Jonathan Charney, and this is our tech day. This is the day that we do all things tech. So today we're going to start out with uh, some different stories about some of the things that are going on around the world. Uh, and uh, Jonathan, you want to start with some of the stuff that you have? Sure. <coughs> Excuse the cough. Um, London police use cell phone tracking device to snoop on citizens. The London Metropolitan Police Force has bought a digital surveillance system used by the U.S. Secret Service and other governments to spy on citizens. This is actually pretty cool. That's uh, the system's known as ICT Hi Hardware, and it comes from a lead-based company called Detong. Basically, it's the size of a suitcase and emits a signal which can blanket an area roughly of 10 square kilometers. I'm not sure what that is in miles. Times three, oh, so it's so about 30 miles. Let's see, 10 square kilometers, causing uh, causing cellular phones to automatically broadcast the owner's international mobile subscriber number, the IMSI, and international mobile equipment identity number. I'm assuming those are so, you. So in other words, this is a black box that they built that makes all phones basically ping and well, say they, what they, they are? They bought it from a U.S. company that built it. That, yeah, basically what it does is the phone, the phone gives its unique identification numbers and gives it over to <laughs> police, <laughs> along oh, with... Well, wait, it gets even better. Oh, great. <laughs> um, see, and the international mobile equipment to Denity, see, as well as the owner's whereabouts, reports CNN. The device then picks up this data, given, given the authorities' information on cellular users' whereabouts. I swear it said something about GPS, but maybe it was something else I was reading. But uh, I bet I bet GPS is is programmed in there too. It wouldn't surprise me. Why not? If it's going to do well, it's got to do. It's location based, so it has to be GPS. We'd be assuming. I mean, a lot most smartphones have some sort of GPS device. So right. I would not be surprised at how you know how right. hard can it be to re you know to ping that out. Yeah, no, it 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 it, ob it has to be a, a GPS device. So, well, the only thing is the only thing I'm wondering is the size of a suitcase. Yeah, I mean, what type of a suitcase? Well, is it talking you know, about you're talking about normally when they as they say the average size that you would take on an airline. That's well, I mean, is, is it the carry-on? Is it the you know the giant trunk thing nah, you put I, in the I, stewage? Or? It's open. It's open to anything. But my assumption is it's a normal like the, like you know roughly this. Yeah, big. yeah, yeah. I mean, today with, with the way I, we have our electronics, it really doesn't matter so much. It, how, you know how how big or little it is. The only thing I'm wondering is this: if it's mobile, does it need to be plugged in? Because if it can blanket area that's ten square kilometers, roughly thirty square miles. Now that's a lot of power. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of power to broadcast. So well, it, it, it is. I'm assuming it's not running on batteries. Uh, it could. Why not? Could be a DC device. Well, but you know, how long would it? You know, they need a pretty big battery to run something that well, long, though. Well, they would. They probably have to put it in a van or something. And don't. Isn't there some kind of antenna that they need to have? It doesn't actually quantify that. It doesn't say anything as if it needs an antenna or not. It just says it can blanket an area and picks up this given you. No, it doesn't actually say anything. Hmm. It is interesting, though. It says it raises a number of serious civil liberties and concerns and clarifications, and there's urgently needed on when and where this technology has been deployed and what data has been gathered. So this is in England, and ha have we not already, a court has already said that law enforcement is allowed to take our phones and use any data that is in our phones against us, I, right? I don't remember, I remember the article, I don't remember if it said, uh, I don't think the courts actually said anything, I just think police, at least here in the U.S., just use it. Well, no, I, I, there was a, something was heard where um, a, a court, a lower court or a higher court, said that yes it's fine uh in a particular case that the law enforcement takes the individual cell phone and uses whatever information is on that cell phone is this is this pre or with a warrant well this is the point they found that you do not need a warrant to be able to do this law, law enforcement can just take your smartphone and do anything they want with it without a warrant bummer well yeah, and maybe that's something that we'll investigate a little bit more because it's it doesn't seem right, but it's it's the way it is. Um, it's like uh, anything in a law enforcement situation where, um, depending on what, you know, let's say you get pulled over by law enforcement, depending on what you get 
pulled over for, they can either search your car without a warrant for officer safety sake, let's say it's a gun related situation, you have no right of privacy with that law enforcement can go in and search the car for firearms. But I thought I, I thought the only way they could do that though is if it was, you know, like places that weren't locked or visible. A, a they can't go in the trunk or the glove box without some sort of warrant. In plain view. Or, or super probable, prob probable cause. Well, I, that's the way it is in, in a um, private par uh, property situation in a home or a building well, or what something. what about a but car? But in a car. So they can, they, can, they can open the trunk and all that? They can do anything they want depending on what you pull over over for so so if they just use the excuses um, you're going you five miles over the limit that doesn't give them enough probable cause no I wouldn't think so I think they would have to be specific as to what it is that they're that you were pulled over for so. the, the interesting thing because I know London especially has cameras everywhere so I'm not I'm not quite sure why everybody's complaining I mean because if you're on camera all the time everywhere you go then why do they care about the cell phones I mean I don't like being on camera I mean they're they're already known but they're they can already be tracked via everywhere on camera well it's like here in the states law enforcement can record you all they want uh, video but they can't record the audio without a warrant um, so I don't know in this situation they're not really doing anything other than trying to locate a particular phone right yeah, I mean, it seems like they could do the same thing with the cameras. I mean, there'd be basically they'd be tracking whatever it was, whoever it was, via the camera. Well, the camera's not going to follow you inside a building. They won't know where you are by a camera. Cell but they phones will. don't always follow you inside the building either. Okay, now now we're nitpicking. Hmm. You know, but the fact is now, basically, if law enforcement wants to, um, which is interesting. So, tell me again. It says that it it. Any phones within 30 miles, it'll it'll tell this piece of equ equipment where it's located? Yeah, it says the, the device is the size of a suitcase and emits a signal which can blanket an area roughly of 10 square kilometers, causing cellular phones to automatically broadcast the owner's international mobile subscriber number, an IMSI, and the international mobile equipment identity, the IMEI as well as the owner's whereabouts, reports CNET. This device picks up on this data, given, giving the authorities information on the cell, phones, the cell phone user's whereabouts. Yeah, okay, so it's using GPS to say where things are at. So uh, I guess basically what they're saying, at least in England, because I haven't heard anything about it here in the States, is that um, you don't have a right to privacy uh, on your phone uh, when they activate the... Um, it's basically like an app that you would put on your iPhone that allows you to go online to find your phone. Yeah. So it's in essence, it's that same kind of thing. So criminals turn off your cell phone. They can't track you that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Criminals. Let's 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 help them. So, well, gee, I, I don't know what to think about that. It's kind of like um, my favorite thing, though, is I don't know I, I don't if they know. can see it. Is I love the picture. If you look at the picture they show you, and the bottom says it's not the device being used by Scotland Yard. Uh, we don't have <laughs> we don't have a close up device, but I I, Here, I know go. you guys can't can like oh hold on it looks like Mickey looks like uh, uh, Mickey Mouse ears <laughs> that was a picture that they put together for that so that was pretty funny so. I just it's it's funny it says yeah it, this is from Venture Beat and it says the attached image image is not the device being used by Scott and Yard I just thought it was hilarious <laughs> yeah they had to put a disclaimer in on the picture exactly yeah the figures so. All right. Well, I've got one. Let's let's see. Um, as you know, uh, Meg Whitman has become the CEO to HP, and she is taking this opportunity to decide what to really do with WebOS. Um, so for now, uh, it's also she's also stating that uh, HP is going to continue to be in the PC market. So previously, we thought they were getting out of that that market and that oh, WebOS was dead. Well, not so yet. So it looks like uh, the, the new CEO is uh, going to go ahead and um, take a look at uh, uh, keeping it. So is, is that the article where she specifies HP, uh, the, the WebOS isn't exactly what we do? No. Mm -mm. No, this is another one. This one says that uh, she says it's uh, really important to make the right decision, not the fast decision. Regard regardless, she is said to have promised a final word within the next three to four weeks. So within the next month, we're going to know what uh, uh, HP is going to do with um, 
uh, Palm's uh, patents and WebOS. So, but you know, when you think about it, there's there's a few things that um, HP could do, uh, you know, with this uh, OS. So one could be they could sell it. I mean, they just bought it, but they could turn around and sell it. I don't have the numbers what they bought it for, but it's two to, three, two to three billion, I believe it was in that particular spot. It was a billion number. Yeah, and then they can keep it and develop it uh, and work on it, And um, which I personally, being the HP Touch fan, I mean, it's not an iPad, but it's pretty damn close. I really like it. I'd really like to see support go on for it and more apps being written for it. So that's one thing they could do. They could find a partner uh, and partner up with somebody on that, but that's not necessarily a very clear working way of doing things, especially with HP. So it would be a spin off company where um, either somebody buys in or some group and they partner with it. So, yeah, I guess that's a possibility down the road. Um, they could spin it off, make it its own entity. So now that HP has a uh, web OS uh, mobile device um, spin off. Uh, and then, of course, the famous Cisco. Uh, we don't think it works well for us anymore. Uh, we'll just turn it off. You know, just shut her down. And and it's like the argument we had before. We talked a little bit about it in one of our other episodes about um, these companies have so much money. They they have so much money that they're able to just throw away billions of dollars, and it's it's almost mind mind boggling what they're able to do with it. So. You know, so here's your, your possibilities. Sell it, keep it, partner with it, spin it off, or shut it down. I really don't see any other things that you're going to be able to do with this. And personally, I hope uh, that they uh, they keep it and they work on it. And they, you know, I, I think in the Marina tablets, I think they were as good as any. And um, I'd like to see it. Um, I think there's so many Android devices out there, which we've, we've played with a few. Of course, my, my phone is an Android phone. It works okay, but it's very, um, very geeky. You know, you know what I mean. It's it's really um, a phone for people that understand how things work. Where the iPhone is much cleaner interface, and anybody can pretty much use it. You could give it to your mother and say, you know, here here's the few tricks to use it, and it and it works. So maybe there's a uh, situation with that. But anyway, I would I would personally, in my own personal life, love to see HP. Uh, keep uh, keep the OS and keep working with it. So, anyway, Meg, we look forward to hearing from you in the next three to four weeks, and I'm hoping uh, for our sake that you decide to keep it. So, what about you? What do you got got going going now? <coughs> the second one is let's see, vulnerability allows hackers to open prison doors. Oh yeah, I read about that one. And something from. Yeah, unfortunately, part of the thing got cut off, so I can't read the other part of it. Um, let's see. Well, the case of what happened is... Uh, see, hold on. Where is it? I have to talk somewhere like some sort of something happened, uh, like some sort of trickle, some sort of voltage leak enough to trip the electronic doors, kept locks kept keeping, you know. Basically, it seems like what happened is there was a voltage leak, and it tripped the... The doors to open. Well, the the last article I read on that literally says it was a hack. Well, there's there's two things. It says, um, let's see. So he thankfully didn't have his own prison doors hacked into that night. Rather, part of his security system was leaking enough voltage to trip the electronic locks, keeping the prisoners safe in their cells. The close call was too close for Strauss, who knew that sort of event could happen by accident, and, and there's a way to explode it, exploit it. See, so what if you could do if you could trip it deliberately? So it happened. Page two. It talks about uh, so st this guy and his team went to work. It's uh, to uh, work poking holes in the system. It's uh, they created a malicious code. It's only thirty lines of code using legitimate software that was roughly legally it was twenty five hundred dollars, and n you know you could get for five hundred if you wanted to buy yeah. it off some funky website okay <coughs> and um he said so far they've seen two ways to actually ex executing executing the code one is two ways is you can do it by social engineering talking 
essentially talking away into the physical location of the target and installing a USB drive with a malicious code. Or you can find internet access. And what the, they're saying is that the second part is the worst one because a lot of these central command centers not, are not supposed to have internet access. Right. In the article that the guy talks about, he's actually, he's, uh, let's see, uh, says, uh, let's see, he's found people surf the internet. He said uh, he's designed 114 design systems and can't imagine why central control needs access to the internet, or for that matter, a USB drive. He says he's, he says he saw prison guards checking his Facebook account in a control center he once toured. You know, so it's saying that these things that, you know, one of the main central security systems in the in the prison have access to the internet and they're they're greater risk because malicious code can sure. be in, injected sure. through that. So why would the prison system have their uh, their their code live on the or their access live on the internet so somebody could get in? What's the reason behind that? They don't they don't say it. they don't actually say it. The, the most amazing part is that even the article says the most dangerous part is the central control may never know that doors have been opened. In fact the code can cloak its activity and make it seem that everything else is fine. But just because the doors haven't been opened doesn't mean the prisoners can't immediately escape. You know, they're basically they're saying there's hurdles to get outside, but you know the doors could open randomly. Or they also say in the article that they could actually lock people into their cells and then say set the thing on fire. That's just amazing. I I just they, they don't they don't really say why um, these main central locations have internet. My only thing is they could probably just because they're just straight bored. You know. Yeah. I don't know. I you know got to have something to do, but well, yeah, but still, why is why is the the the, the prison uh, control system for the for the doors connected? They, yeah, why is it? I don't know to the net. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know. I, I I don't know. That's a good question. My other thing is how exactly you know would somebody find the IP? Because I'm assuming you'd have to find you'd have to find the the external IP number of the prison and then find the the internal IP. So, I mean, it's a lot of work. Well, somebody did an awful lot of sniffing to try to figure out where it's at and or there was inside information and somebody letting yeah, them but know. This, this guy is the guy who designed it or works there. I don't remember what specifically he says, but, you know, he's basically, he saw what could happen. He's wondering if he could trigger it deliberately. So he deliberately hacked in getting a system to do his own system to see if it could be done. And, it, you know, basically there's been a few agencies have started looking to the depths um, of what can happen, how to stop it. He's, the one thing it says is, I don't know if I agree with this, is most people in America aren't computer savvy and don't want to be. Basically is saying that uh, that they're insecure because they don't, know the, they don't know the difference. I'm not quite sure if I would agree with that. You know, yeah, I'm not even sure where that falls into that, but that's pretty, well, I mean, pretty it, dumb. It, you know, it's saying that internet ignorance or ignorance of the internet, you know, what is, you know, what can be done, what shouldn't be done. I mean, I can see a lot of older Americans, but most people younger than me have been using the internet their entire life. So yeah. generally, they seem to be safe. I'd be assuming. Well, obviously, this is some kind of exploit, and it was a code. Yeah, yeah I mean, and and this guy refuses. This guy says he's not going to release the code, but he says he's not sure if that's going to do any good because it's only thirty lines. He said you could easily make it without even trying. You know, so he said, you know. Okay. Well, I'd like to follow up on that. There's got to be more to this story. It's seems a little strange but. i know i wish they said they didn't say why they didn't say the prison nor did they say you know why the main section had internet i, I don't quite I, I really don't understand that okay well that would take a little more research to make any sense of what the heck's going on because that's that that's kind of a, I, weird anyway I, I think it's weird I, trying to figure out why in the heck would you allow access codes or a program that opens and closes prison doors to be connected to the internet I'm, I'm assuming it's a it's not software it's hardware so i don't know i, I really don't yeah I, I don't get it well whatever let's just hope that uh that isn't something widespread because that could sh sure be a problem so well good okay so there's that one and then i've got one um that's been kicked around for quite a while and um, one of the things that Steve Jobs said when designing the iPad is that he was not going to allow Flash uh, to be into the iPad or um, <coughs> the iPhones and so um, there was a lot of talk and speculation that this was going to be kind of the uh, death nail in the Flash 
and it appears that um, he may be right. Um, it it appears that uh, HTML5 is going to become the new standard, and that even Adobe has finally come to realize that um, that the nail is in the coffin for Flash. Well, that's which, is that the one where it talks about mobile though? <laughs> well, because on a mobile phone, Flash sucks down battery. HTML5 correct. doesn't do that as much. Uh, correct. Yeah. Um, basically, uh, the article that I was quoting, uh, Adobe's love affair with Flash has come to an end, according to Adobe. Uh, they are just killing development on mobile browser Flash in favor of HTML5. Uh, but, do you, you know, do we think that Adobe's really going to continue working on Flash if they're going to, you know, really now go to work to HTML5 and make that the standard? My guess is if if Adobe is going to go ahead and do that, them getting rid of it because there's still a ton of sites that use it. What they'll probably do is kill it for mobile development because for one, there wasn't a whole. I don't think a lot of people were watching Flash movies with their their phones, anyways. I'm um, they, you know, I still see it being used um, on websites. I mean, I don't see any, you know. Well, I know for me personally, being a developer, uh, I use a lot of Flash and many different things. One of the biggest uses for Flash, and it's, it, it has nothing to do with video, uh, it's a Flash form uh, system that I have that uh, on this, one of the sites that I maintain, people have to fill out a form. And it's actually a Flash form, and it works so well. I mean, it's uh, it's beautiful. Works great. Yes, I can do the same thing in JavaScript, but but I haven't found as clean a solution as uh, using the one in Flash. It really works well. So, um, oh, Adobe isn't just saying that it'll forget about Flash, but Adobe wants to bring all the Flash goodness it can to HTML5. Um, so, I would say we, we will see more of a, a final. Uh, uh, approval of HTML5, which version is going to be finally approved uh, as the standard, and it'll be interesting to work with it. I have not worked with it. Uh, I have no idea how it works, but uh, I'm sure we're going to see some tools fairly soon uh, that are going to tell us how to, to work with uh, HTML5, and, and maybe something similar as Dreamweaver is in, in uh, Adobe. Um, we'll see what happens. But the other thing that we now that's going to happen is uh, Silverlight. I think Silverlight is done. It's cooked. I read something today talking about uh, after the next release of Silverlight, Microsoft might that might be it. But it, I didn't read the article. I was just you know. Yeah, it, this particular article uh, just touches base a little bit on Silverlight, but it says that uh, Microsoft's one-time rival, the Flash, it's toast. Even before this news, it wasn't sure things we'd ever see another version didn't Microsoft said they didn't think we'd see another version of Silverlight uh, and uh, the day of the non-standard video format seemed to be coming to an end and, and that's what I was talking about in HTML5 is that you know they're working on the standard and it'll be standard that all the browsers will support instead of having to either put in a, uh, a plug-in or an app or not being able to uh, use that content at all. So well, HTML still has a Kodak, though. I mean, it's using H.264. I mean, that's another problem is because uh, uh, some consortium of like MPEG LA or whatever owns the rights, and I think that's who owns it. And some people are worried. One of the reasons why Google bought that their their video format is they're worried that potentially because it says you know free for consumers, but if your business you know, you might have to use it. I mean, they're afraid of the the people that own the H two dot six four actually saying, "Okay, now you're with the standard that you everybody owes us money for using it." Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, but <clears throat> I, I think in the next couple of years, we're uh, as developers, uh, it'll be interesting to see how everything shakes out. But uh, right now, everything's pointing to H HTML five, and my guess is that's what we're going to see as the standard. So. Um, Good luck on that one. I know for uh, the rest of you, uh, you developers out there like myself, uh, it's going to be tough to walk away from Flash, but hopefully there'll be some great HTML5 tools out there that'll work as well or as, as easy. So we'll have to see what happens with that. But uh, uh, on this article, uh, and this one came from uh, ZDNet. Uh, thank you, ZDNet. Uh, basically says that Flash is dead. Long live HTML5. So. <laughs>
I thought that was a very interesting sign off. Uh, anything else from you? No, those are the, the two articles I found that you know I like the best. Yeah, we uh, I got one more, and it's not really tech. It's um, the Earth almost came to an end. <laughs> I don't know about that, but um, uh, a 1300 space rock missed Earth last night in the closest encounter by such a massive space rock in more than three decades. Um, it's how, how close over is the close? Size, well, I, I think I can find that for you. Uh, it's about the size of an aircraft carrier. Okay. Uh, which is very serious, of course. Which type of aircraft carrier? Oh, give me a break. Well, I mean, there's a huge difference between a Nimitz class and one you... Not really. You're talking a few hundred feet. Anyway, this thing was uh, 1,300 feet wide. So go from there. It was pretty damn big. Um, uh, the asteroid has traveled light years to reach us on a trajectory affected by planets, asteroids, space dust, and more. Uh, it passed within a mere uh, two, basically 200,000 miles from Earth. So how? So it's between us and the moon. Okay. So that's pretty, pretty good. Yeah. So. It's it, and in some respects, it was closer. It's closer to us than the moon was, so that's pretty dug and close. So, uh, it was called Asteroid 205 YU55. It's in a, an elliptical orbit, um, meaning it passes the Earth, Venus, and Mars regularly, zooming in and out, uh, zooming over our heads. They go to say. As many and many times it's done that, so this is the first time we've seen it. So people are kind of wondering how come we didn't see something this big before. Um, so that, and then in this particular article from Fox, the scary thing is that this thing has been past the Earth several times, and we never noticed it before. <laughs> That's kind of scary. So I don't know uh, what the equivalent would be to TNT blasts or uh, megaton blasts, whatever, but it would have been pretty devastating. Uh, so. We uh, we lucked out again. Hopefully, it hits Iran. You know, a country that we're oh, having problems with. Let's not go there. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. You know, I mean, no. I hope it splashes I, harmlessly in the ocean, but I don't think uh, uh, I don't know what the effect would be depending on where it hits, as far as how it would affect the atmosphere. And well, if we I'm would just saying, if, if it's going to hit somewhere, how about hitting an enemy? <laughs> Good for you, John. <laughs> I don't want to go there. I want to be a little more politically correct <laughs> so, <laughs> on that. But anyway, yeah. So that we almost came to an end. That would have been. That would have been. We lucked out again, Earth, one more time. So, anyway, uh, that's all I have for today. This is a short Tech Wednesday, but uh, our effort is always to bring you some more. Uh, one of the hopes is is that we were going to bring you uh, more on the uh, net neutrality. Uh, legislation that's going through Congress, but uh, uh, we were going to have Heather in show with us to talk about that one. She's studying studying that pretty good, and uh, I think we all need to get a real handle on the definition of it and why are certain companies and government in favor of it and some not. And so we won't touch on this right now, but uh, I will say thank you for watching us on Tech Wednesday. We hope you come back every Wednesday. This is Rob Charney and Jonathan Charney. And we will see you guys next time. Thanks for coming to Old Guy Tech TV. This episode of Old Guy Tech TV is brought to you by Windfall. Windfall, all your resources for El Dorado County. Everybody needs a windfall. Don't forget to ask about the free classified ads. Windfall is available to assist you in promoting your business through affordable and effective advertising. Call Windfall at 530-621-1698. Or send an email to info at shopthewindfall.com. And thank you, Windfall, for supporting Old Guy Tech TV. We'll see you next time.